In the past, I remember I used to attend in-person job fairs as a way to find potential talent for my positions. But the rise of virtual job fairs, online recruiting events, and even digital networking platforms, which is a way to connect employers with candidates, there should never be a shock factor if an employee resigns because it's important for people managers to take that role seriously and always have a pulse with how their employees are feeling, how their employees are doing, and what possibly the employee needs to feel more engaged with their job. Hello, everyone, and welcome to season two of The Recruiting Revolution. In our inaugural episode, we are joined by the amazing Melissa Grabner from Chicago, USA, who is a senior talent acquisition leader at Christine Matthew Consulting. With an impressive three decades of experience in the HR industry, Melissa stands out as a LinkedIn top recruiting and top job search strategies voice. Her achievements extend to multiple awards in the HR and talent acquisition domain. Apart from this, um, uh, Melissa is a yoga instructor and is a real champion for job seekers around the globe. Uh, welcome to the podcast, Ms. Melissa. Great to have you on the show. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm really looking forward to this discussion. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, you know, before we dive into the specific re recruitment part of the things, can you tell us about your amazing journey so far? Sure. So as you said, I live in Chicago, Illinois. I have been a talent acquisition and HR professional for the last about 25 years. Uh, the bulk of my experience was with a company called Takeda Pharmaceuticals. I was there for 18 years, and I spent the first 10 years as a senior HR business partner. And then the last eight years, I was in talent acquisition. Um, when I left the company, I was the global TA director for the company's largest business. So I had a team of 11 direct reports. We hired about 3,000 employees a year. So it was a lot of high volume recruiting, a very fast paced job. Um, I actually built the department from the ground up. So at the time when um, I joined the talent acquisition function, a lot of our local sites were managing the staffing on their own. So we had no processes, we had no procedures, we had no applicant tracking system. And the leaders of the business that I supported asked me to start this department. I was basically given an open-ended budget. I was able to hire as many employees as I saw that was fit and that I needed. Um, so I brought on a team of talent acquisition coordinators and recruiters. We brought on an applicant tracking system. Um, we created all the various processes and procedures. And um, when I left the company, like I said, we were the largest TA group across the globe. Um, I was there for 18 really wonderful years. Um, and then when I left Takeda, um, I went to a company um, called Walters Clore. I was there for about 18 months. Um, I started as a as just a recruiter. And then nine months after I started, I was promoted to global director. Um, I left that company because they moved their headquarters to New York and I wasn't looking to relocate. So I ended up leaving and then I joined a company called One Digital. And as you said, um, I work for Christine Matthews Consulting, which is actually a business within One Digital. And so what I do now is I work with various clients. Most of them are in the biotechnology or pharmaceuticals industries, um, and they're based out of San Francisco, California. And I have a variety of clients. Some of them, I simply hire positions anywhere from you know, an entry-level job all the way up to like a chief technology officer, a chief marketing officer, and everything in between. And then I have other clients where I build out their entire talent acquisition infrastructure. So because a lot of these companies are startups, they don't have any sort of processes or procedures as it relates to talent acquisition. So depending on the client really depends on the work that I'm doing for them. Um, I've been at this job for about two and a half years and um, I love it very much. And as you said, you know, I, I am a LinkedIn two times top voice, one in recruiting and one in job search strategies. I have a pretty large LinkedIn following um, and I post a lot about job seekers. So I'm a big advocate and champion for job seekers. 
I am a big advocate for the candidate experience. And I also post a lot about just different HR practices and, and what are best practices in HR and talent acquisition. Um, so looking back, I've had a very blessed career and, and I love what I do. And I'm super excited that you reached out to me and, and look forward to this conversation. And it's amazing. Also, uh, to be honest, I love your content on LinkedIn. Like every post is something I read like thoroughly. It, it doesn't happen or quite often because at times like lapse a lot. But yeah, I love your content on LinkedIn. Any particular reason that, uh, you know, that drove you, uh, you know, for the job seekers or, you know, writing all those amazing content back in the days? Yeah, so... I have been a job seeker before. So when I left Takeda, I was there for 18 years. Um, to be honest with you, I was scared to death. I didn't have a resume put together. This company was really all I knew. And it was it was a tough situation because I was so comfortable at this one company and I was really happy there. And then all of a sudden I had to create a resume. And even though I have reviewed thousands of resumes in my career. When it came to writing my own, I was like, oh my God, I don't, I really need to figure out how to do this. And so I put my resume together and then I started looking for a job, but I realized that it's a very stressful situation when you're trying to find employment. And so I look back on that time and, and think that, you know, if, if I could help job seekers and and really be a cheerleader for them, that is what my passion is because I know what these people are going through. I know how difficult it is. So I will do anything I can to to help job seekers. And even if one post of mine is the difference between someone finding a job because of the tips and the tools that I post about, then it's all worth it in the end. But I will never stop advocating for job seekers. I'll never stop being a cheerleader for job seekers. And that's, again, because I know exactly how it feels. Yeah. Coming from experience, I feel. Uh, so, you know, uh, when we talk about, you know, uh, the industry, like you've been in the industry for a long time, uh, like you have seen all the visible shifts in hiring process, like from a paper heavy approach to more of you know, tech driven one. So, you know, how has uh, the hiring process transformed over the years, like especially in terms of candidate expectation? Like what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so it's interesting. It's a great question. So when I started in recruiting, there was no such thing as artificial intelligence. Employer branding wasn't really a thing. People weren't working remotely. Um, there wasn't any sort of emphasis on the candidate experience. And so I remember when I started my department, the biggest decision I had to make was, do I use monster.com to post my jobs or do I use career builder to post my jobs? So the pendulum every year kind of changed into like what job company or job board is something that would benefit the organization that I supported. But I think the recruiting kind of landscape has undergone tr uh, significant transformations over the years. And I think a lot of it has been influenced by changes in technology, the candidate expectations, and really overall society shifts. Um, and I think some of the trends that highlight the evolution of the hiring process is, first of all, it's technology. So right now we have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of online job boards. We have LinkedIn, of course. Indeed is a big player in the space. We have Glassdoor. And many companies are now, now using an ATS, which stands for an applicant tracking system. And companies use ATSs to streamline the application process manage the influx of resumes, um, and even track candidate progress in, a, in an efficient way. I think another um, shift over the years has been about social media and employer branding. So companies right now are having a heavy emphasis on employer branding because that's how companies are able to not only attract, but retain their employees. So employer branding is a way for companies to showcase their culture, engage with potential candidates. And companies are, and, and as is correct, should be more focused on building and promoting a positive employer brand because, again, that helps to both retain and attract top talent. And, you know, years ago when I started in talent acquisition, working remotely really wasn't a thing. People didn't work from home. But I think with the COVID, um, you know, situation that happened a couple of years ago, 
a lot of employees were starting to work remotely. And so the rise of remote work has really made it necessary for companies to adapt their hiring process to assess candidate suitability for remote positions. And right now, too, candidates, a lot of them that I speak with, they don't want to work in an office five days a week. They want to prioritize their their families, their work-life balance. So companies that allow these flexible work arrangements are really going to, at the end of the day, win the war for talent. And the other thing I would say, too, is that there is such a big emphasis right now on the candidate experience. So companies, in order to remain competitive, really need to tailor their recruitment processes to provide a personalized experience for candidates. That's really gaining importance. Uh, candidates also deserve and respect and, and want transparent and timely communication. Um, and that's a crucial part of maintaining a positive candidate experience. And actually, I'll, I'll say one more thing. Um, analytics and metrics is a really big priority right now with a lot of talent acquisition departments. So I agree with this, and I think it's important. Employers really need to leverage data analytics because that allows companies to measure and improve the various as aspects of the hiring process, such as how long does it take to fill our positions? What is our cost per hire? What is the level of our candidate satisfaction? So again, you know, the hiring has undergone significant transformations over the years. And I think that's only going to continue in the future. That is true. Uh, so you, of course, AI wasn't a thing back, uh, like a few few years back. Uh, so you know, what are some hiring trends that have you observed that were non-existent earlier? Of course, apart from the technologies and AI that that is so on right now. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the first that comes to mind is artificial intelligence and automation. So. There is continued integration of, auto, of AI in recruiting processes, and especially as it relates to resume screening. A lot of websites have chatbots now, which is helping with candidate interactions and automation of routine tasks. And this is really for companies to enhance efficiency. Um, and I think with the, what, what happened with COVID, there has been an increase of virtual recruiting events. So. In the past, I remember I used to attend in-person job fairs as a way to find potential talent for my positions, but the rise of virtual job fairs, online recruiting events, and even digital networking platforms, which is a way to connect employers with candidates, um, this has been, I think, a big trend in the last couple of years. A lot of companies also are embracing video interviews and assessments. So. I think, too, for companies that are hiring a lot of positions, they use different platforms which help with video interviews and assessments as part of their hiring process. And what this does is it allows for more flexibility in scheduling and really enabling a more comprehensive evaluation of candidates. Um, and the other thing I would say, and I really love this one, is there has been such a big focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. So, you know, when I started in talent acquisition, diversity and inclusion wasn't really a thing. No one really talked about it. But nowadays, there is such a heightened emphasis on DNI and recruiting. And a lot of organizations are actively implementing strategies to attract and retain a more diverse works workforce, which I love and I absolutely agree with. Yeah, that is true. Uh, you know, while while discussing candidate expectation, like workforce continues to evolve in this time, uh, in this landscape, uh, actually. So how do you think career expectations has shifted across generations? No, definitely. I, I think the dynamics between employers and employees has undergone significant evolution. And I think it's driven by a couple factors. I think it's society, society expectations it's definitely about technology advancements and really shift in work preferences. So when I started again in talent acquisition, there really wasn't any sort of talk about culture, like the, the, the a company culture, but now it's kind of all the rage, right? T companies are always talking about um, how they have a great culture and, and a good culture is what drives people to want to work for that company, but also helps retain, retain employees. So I think generally speaking, employers are recognizing the importance of creating inclusive and employee-centric cultures. 
And this is part of, you know, fostering a positive work environment, promoting really good work-life balance, and prioritizing employee well-being, whether that's employee mental or physical health. And again, flexible work arrangements. You know, companies now have to embrace this in order to remain competitive. So the demand for flexible work arrangements, including remote work options, has increased. So in my job now, I am 100% remote. I work from, from home. And that has absolutely enriched my life. So when I started working remotely at the time, I had two sons that were both in high school. So being able to work remote allowed me to see them in the morning, be home when they came home from school. And I was so appreciative of, with the ability to work remotely that I think I worked that much harder because of how you know grateful I was to my organization that they allowed flexible work arrangements. And I think employers that adapt to these preferences will help contribute to a more adaptable and dynamic workplace. And I think the other thing is the emphasis on the employee experience. And so companies are placing a greater emphasis on enhancing the overall experience of their employees. And this includes things such as a really robust and thorough onboarding process, professional development opportunities, and really continuous feedback mechanisms. Employees want feedback. They want to know how they're doing. They want development opportunities, whether that's going back to school, obtaining an advanced degree, taking additional courses to help them with their development. These are things, generally speaking, I think that a lot of employees are wanting and a lot of employees are now providing. Got it. Also, you know, you mentioned uh, flexible working and culture and, you know, uh, do you think that employers who are not uh, embracing this change uh, will lose top candidates? Like, are these the factors that can contribute to losing some top talent? There's, there's no question that that is correct. So as a perfect example, um, right now, I am working with a, a wonderful client and um they offer a hybrid work schedule. So in other words, they, you know, employees can work in the office a couple of days, but they can work remotely a couple of days. And that is a huge drawing factor for people that don't want to work from the office five days a week. Um, there are a lot of companies that do not allow employees to work from home. And there's no question in my mind that their candidate pool is smaller than companies that embrace the remote opportunities. Um, like I said a little bit earlier, when I was working a hybrid model and even you know my job now where I work fully remote, there is no question that I would not have been in the jobs I've been in if I had to have worked out of the office five days a week. The whole shift has changed. And companies need to embrace this change if they want to hire the best talent. Um, the number one question I am asked of candidates, and this has been for the last five years, is is the remote is the role remote or is the role hybrid? And I have lost candidates, a lot of candidates, because um, maybe you know, like the business I was supporting in the past didn't allow this. If a company wants to win the war for talent, they absolutely must adhere to this, or these people are going to go elsewhere and find a job or a company that allows and embraces remote work. Yeah, that is that is so true. Also, you know, other than uh, the tips that you mentioned, like, what are some more, uh, you know, tips that you can uh, give to the employers to retain those employees other than flexible working? And of course, the culture is the main part. Yeah, I think the culture, um, I think culture is everything. And and there's been an evolving dynamic in the workplace. And this relates to how people have their own career expectations. And I think it's shifted across the generation. So I remember like my father every day for 30 years would commute three hours a day to his job. Because at the time, there was no remote work. It wasn't even a thing. We didn't have the technology for it. Um, and also, there was loyalty to one employer, right? So, you know, 30 years ago, 
40 years ago, 50 years ago, there was no such thing as people switching jobs every couple of years. There was more of that loyalty to a single employer. Now it has completely shifted where it is very rare if I ever review a resume where someone has been at a job for a long time. When I was at my career, my last employer for 18 years, I was an exception. I was not the norm. The norm now is for people to switch jobs every couple of years. It is not for people to stay at one job for a long time. So I think that over time, things have shifted. And I think in the future, things are going to continue to evolve. Things are going to continue to, sh to shift. Um, but I think it's really important that companies embrace what it takes to retain and attract employees because they are the ones that are going to absolutely win the war for talent. Yes, that is so true. Uh, you know, you mentioned the shift uh, in the work, like the workplace landscape. Do you also think that uh, the relationship between the employee and the employer has also evolved uh, like in this modern workplace? The, the, there's no question. I think that you know, it, in the past, it was someone was employed at a company and they did as they were told and they were loyal to that company. But nowadays, employer employees want more. They want work-life balance. They want companies to provide really good benefits. They want companies to embrace mental health and physical health. They want continuous learning opportunities. So companies that are able to attract or retain the right talent have an emphasis on the employee well-being and really listen to their employees to find out what's important to them. When I was at that company, Takeda, for 18 years, um, I had a team of 11 direct reports. And every month, I would meet with each of my direct, in, my direct reports and I would ask them, what has gone well for you this past month? What has not gone well? What more learning opportunities would you like? How can I better support you as your boss? Or I, I don't like the word boss, but how can I better support you as your as your supervisor? So I think it's really important that employers and, and people managers have conversations with their employees and have the pulse of their employees to make sure that they're doing whatever they can to retain their employees. So I also am a firm believer in that if an employee resigns from a company and gives their notice, it should never be a surprise to the employer because the employer should have a pulse on how their employees are feeling. And this way, they work with their employees to do whatever they can to make their employees happy, you know, obviously within reason. So again, there should never be, I believe, there should never be a shock factor if an employee resigns because it's important for people managers to take that role seriously and always have a pulse with how their employees are feeling, how their employees are doing, and what possibly the employee needs to feel more engaged with their job. Understood. Um, also, you know, uh, taking our conversation ahead when you, when you talk about sh shift in culture and you know the relationship with the employees and employer we have to talk about uh, one of your uh, like blogs mentioning the golden rules of effective talent acquisition in, in the current scenario and the current job landscape can you tell us more about the rules and uh, all uh, about the blog no absolutely so i think effective hiring practices are absolutely crucial for building a successful and dynamic workforce so the first thing is that clear job descriptions are super important. So the the job descriptions have to be accurate, they have to be comprehensive, and they have to clearly outline the roles and responsibilities of the position. And I think this helps attract candidates who more closely align with the requirements and reduces the likelihood of any sort of mismatch. Um, the candidate experience absolutely has to be prioritized. So creating a positive candidate experience, and this starts at the first interaction, which is really that, that job description. And that includes like transparent communication, timely feedback, and a smooth, respectful recruiting process. What's so important about the candidate experience is that it can enhance the employer brand, even for candidates who are not ultimately hired. 
And I think the other thing is, and I spoke about this a little bit earlier, is I think one of the golden rules is embracing diversity and inclusion. So companies that do it right prioritize DNI in their hiring practices. They foster an inclusive work environment. They actively seek candidates from diverse backgrounds. And this not only contributes to a more robust workforce, but it also enhances the organization's reputation. And I would say effective use of technology. So it's lever leveraging technology for efficient and data-driven hiring processes. So the vast majority of companies use what's called an applicant tracking system, um, which is a way, and I know I spoke about this a little er bit earlier, but it's a way for companies to kind of manage all of their candidates. Um, so ATSs and, and even like artificial intelligence power power tools to help with things like resume screening, video interviewing platforms, chatbots. These help to streamline the recruited, recruiting process and really enhance objectivity. Um, and collaborative hiring decisions. So it's important that companies involve the relevant stakeholders in the hiring process. I think what a lot of companies do now, and I actually agree with this, is that when when they bring in candidates for an interview, it's not just the candidate interviewing who their boss with who their boss would be, but it's involving people who the employee would be working with. So a collaborative decision making process, including input from team members who will work closely with the new hire, I think helps to ensure a better cultural fit and a more holistic review and evaluation of candidates. Um, and so what I always say to job seekers, and, and I talk about this on some of my LinkedIn posts, is that the hiring process is a two-way street. So it's not only the companies that are making these decisions, but it's the candidates who are making these decisions as well. You know, candidates always have the power to walk away. So if they're interviewing for a job and something doesn't feel right, Maybe they're asked to go through multiple interviews. Maybe they're asked to create like a very robust and in-depth presentation, take a skills assessment test. If something doesn't feel right, if they're not treated well during the hiring process, we always have the power as candidates to walk away. It's not just the employer making these decisions, but the employee or the candidate makes those decisions as well. Interviewing is definitely a two-way street. And just as much as the company is interviewing candidates, I always instruct candidates to interview the company at the same time. Yeah, I think uh, because, you know, nowadays, like everyone has so much of information, like especially the employees and the candidates, like passive candidates as well. That is where they, they can actually counter everything with the interviewee, I feel. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, so, yeah, uh, you know, as my last question, uh, you know, looking into the recruiting crystal ball, like what cool and exciting stuff do you think the future of recruiting or recruitment has in store for us? Yeah, this is something that I love talking about. So I, I think the future of recruiting is likely to be shaped by ongoing technology advancements, changing workforce dynamics, evolving expectations of both the employer and the candidates. Um, some of the trends that I see is the first is the increased role of artificial intelligence. And I really believe that AI will play a more significant role in automating various aspects of the recruiting process. And again, this could be, you know, resume screening, chatbot interactions, and even predictive analytics for candidate assessments. And I think the other thing is, is really, and I know I spoke about this earlier, but it's an enhanced candidate experience. So companies that do it right and the companies that want to win the war for talent have to have ongoing efforts to enhance the overall candidate experience through personalized interactions, streamlined application processes, um, and really even like virtual reality or augmented reality for virtual interviews. Those two are incredibly important. Um, and again, the workplace is evolving. Companies need to embrace remote work. They need to embrace hybrid work adaptations. Recruitment processes, I believe, will be further adapted to accommodate remote and hybrid work models, right? So virtual recruiting events, even remote onboarding, and new tools to assess candidate suitability for remote roles 
And of course, again, and, and I love this one is, you know, the emphasis on diversity and inclusion. So this is really important to a lot of candidates. I'm a big passionate advocate for diversity and inclusion. And so companies will need to increasingly prioritize diversity and equity and, and inclusion in their recruitment strategies. Um, and even leveraging technology and data analytics to address any sort of biases and promote fairness in the hiring process. So the, those are the big ones, I think, as, as we're going to see. And actually, I, I want to mention one more, if that's okay. Um, social media and employer branding is, is huge. So the role of social media in recruiting will continue to grow. Com companies need to leverage platforms for employer branding. A lot of recruiting um, departments, and, and I see this a lot in big companies, they have employees that focus solely on employer branding. So how can the company brand its employer value proposition? How can they brand the company to excite candidates to want to even apply for a role in their organization? So companies need to embrace social media. They need to embrace employer branding. This will definitely help companies win the war for talent. That that is so true. I also feel that you know aligning uh, the hiring practices with a company's brand identity. I think it's it's even more important in in this landscape. I feel. I absolutely agree for sure. Yep. So uh, Melissa, th thank you so much, and you know that concludes my side. And it was amazing that you joined today, and uh, thank you for taking the time out and joining us on the podcast today. Oh, it was my pleasure. Um, it was so nice talking to you. And um, thank you again. Thank you so much, Felisa. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.